webinar, our first in a series of webinars on energy. This first one is focused on smart grid technology, and it's uh, entitled Using Emerging Technologies for Energy Stewardship. We have three great speakers here today uh, on the phone with us, and you'll get to see them in person as well. We have Lisa Magnuson from Silver Spring Networks. We have Ruben Aronin from Global Green, and we have the Reverend Michael Livingston from the National Council of Churches. I'm going to be your moderator, so I'm opening you up right now. I want to give you a few instructions and then tell you about what we're going to do at the end when we have our question and answer period. So you will have an opportunity to ask questions. So for those of you that are on the web, and hopefully you all are, and if you're having any um, problems, please email me at Cassandra at nccecojustice.org. But you should have been able to log in OK, and then you'll use your chat box, which is in the lower right-hand uh, corner of your screen. And you can use that to ask a question. You can use that to raise your hand. Uh, you can send questions directly to myself. You can send it to uh, the whole group. You can send comments to the whole group, comments to myself. You can also send it to the moderator. And we thank very much Jesse from the United Church of Christ who's been our uh, sort of facilitator technologically on all this. So I will turn this over to open up uh, to Lisa, and Lisa will walk you through some of the um, technical ends of Smart Grid, and then we'll move to Ruben and then Reverend Lovingston. So Lisa? Great, Cassandra. Thank you so much, and um, thank you very much for having us, and Reverend Livingston, thank you very much. Um, so. The first thing we really want to go over is what's the smart grid? Um, if you take a look at the electrical grid in the United States, it was built in the 1890s. I think one of the, uh, there's a very common uh, analogy in the utility world right now is that if Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison came back and looked at their inventions, um, uh, uh, Bell would look at the iPhone or smartphone and go, holy cow, look what you've done. Um, you've taken you know, the very first telephone and you have made it this platform for communicating. If, you, um, if Tom Edison came back and looked at the Leco, grid, he would say, oh, wow, okay, uh, nothing's changed. Um, so if you look at some of the uh, statistics um, on the grid, it's it, it is considered one of the marvels of the 20th century. Um, it consists of 99,200 electrical generating units with more than 1 million megawatts of generating capacity connected to more than 300,000 transmission lines. The average age of a transformer is 42 years old. 60% of the current electrical grid will need to be replaced within the next 10 years. And what an old and aging uh, grid means to a consumer uh, and to businesses is that outages um, can be more frequent. And there was 41% more outages affecting 50,000 or more consumers in the second half of the 90s. These outages and interruptions cost each of us about $500 a year. So. The, the takeaway from this slide is that our energy needs are changing, not only here, but in the United States. We need to make more efficient use of the energy that we have, and we need to be, get smarter um, about how we do it. So one of the solutions to um, this energy uh, issue is to digitize the electrical grid. So instead of having it be just a one-way system where electricity is being generated and transmitted to consumers, it really becomes a two-way um, a two-way network where consumers get information, they have additional control, um, and they can see what type of energy they're using and when. So um, the smart grid is really you can think of it as uh, an in internet uh, for energy. Uh, the benefits include more efficient transmission of electricity. So just by digitizing the grid, uh, electricity can be transmitted 3 to 4% more efficiently. There can be a quicker restoration of electricity after an outage. Um, one of the things that got me so interested in smart grid uh, many years ago was I was living in a, a, territory that, a utility territory that did not have smart grid. 
and I didn't know that my electric meter was not hooked up to my utility. And so three or more people in the area have to call uh, when there's an outage. With Smart Grid, uh, there's an instantaneous uh, notice to the utility that a meter is out. Um, so there can be a, a reduction in peak demand also, which helps lower our uh, electricity rates. Um, and there's also going to be an increased integration of renewables, um, wind, solar, and electric vehicles. Um, and then there's going to also be um, increased integration of um, microgrids or uh, what's called um, uh, distributed generation, and then improved security. So if you really uh, drill down a little bit, what does this all mean for all of us? And it will mean that um, there is improved energy productivity um, by using, by providing consumers with better visibility into their energy usage. Uh, peaker plants, which are the plants that are turned on during the really hot times when they need immediate generation, um, might, not be, be, uh, might not be built. Um, and in fact, one of our utility clients is Oklahoma Gas and Electric, who through energy efficiency and the integration of wind, um, have been able to delay the building of two fossil fuel plants between now and 2020. Um, also, active demand management. So by reducing uh, peak demand, utilities um, will be able to improve the system sta sta stability and reduce or eliminate forced outages. Uh, consumers are going to have better uh, insight into how they're using energy. So instead of getting a bill uh, 30 days after you've used electricity or gas, you're going to be able to have real-time access to see if you um, have been going above or below um, what you've set as your energy budget for the month. Um, and then there'll be uh, more efficient use of renewable energy, as, as I mentioned. So the smart grid and our economy. Uh, the smart grid also has a direct impact on our, our uh, economy by providing green jobs. Um, to date, uh, the smart grid has uh, created about 17,000 jobs. Um, in addition, the clean energy uh, economy has added about a half a million jobs between 2003 and 2010, expanding at about 3.4%. So the clean economy offers more opportunities and better pay for low and middle uh, uh, skilled workers than the national economy as a whole. And also the wages uh, for the clean energy uh, workers are often higher um, than those um, in the, uh, some of the other uh, environments. The smart grid also has a huge impact on our environment. So it will enable us as a country uh, to realize the enormous potential of renewable energy, building efficiency, and clean transportation. Um, and we'll see massive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and oil consumption. Um, the smart grid will help uh, accelerate the adoption of wind and solar, um, but also additional clean and renewable energy sources, such as biomass, geothermal, ocean and, and tidal energy. And the implementation of the smart grid in the United States could reduce carbon from electrical power by 25% or roughly 10% um, of our U.S. CO2 emissions. So this is equivalent to removing 140 million cars from the road. Another one of the benefits of the smart grid is security and reliability. By enabling this two-way communication uh, between the utility and um, the electric meters and the customers and small businesses, utilities for the first time have visibility into what's going on on the grid. Um, last summer on the East Coast and the Midwest with the heat, it was actually quite remarkable that there were no huge blackouts or brownouts. And that was a result of better, um, Resili more resiliency in our electrical system, and it was also uh, due to increased uh, demand response uh, and visibility across our grid. So when a power outage occurs, smart grid technologies can detect and isolate the outages 
containing them before they become large-scale blackouts. So um, it, the smart grid can also help um, with faster restoration times by pinpointing exactly where the outages is and being able to deploy those crews to fix the, um, those outages much faster. And I think what's really exciting is the smart grid really gives us as consumers um, visibility for the very first time into how we're using electricity, when we're using it, and how much it costs. So as we all know, uh, we um, traditionally have gotten our utility bills 30 days after we've used our electricity. Um, and no visibility. So it would be very similar to going to a gas station or a grocery store, buying gas or groceries all month long, um, not knowing how much anything costs, and then at the end of the month you'd get a bill. So by having this increased visibility uh, into how you as a consumer are consuming energy, um, yeah, consumers have been able to reduce their monthly energy consumption by 10 to 15 percent. So this is huge, and when you look at um, how small businesses also have been able to track and save money. Uh, one of the school districts in um, Oklahoma, in Norman, Oklahoma, saved $15,000 in just two months after being able to um, participate in uh, a smart grid program. It's a lot of money. That money can go to teachers, it can go to books. So uh, here are some of the uh, smart apps for the smart home and the smart consumer. So um, as I've mentioned, uh, one of the benefits of the smart grid is really providing uh, people with the uh, information about what they're using and how they're using it. So if you look here, um, you can see an iPhone app as well as a uh, web-based energy portal um, that gives consumers uh, visibility into how much they are using. So um, you can also uh, see, you can also um, set your budget. Um, you can sign up to receive email, email alerts or text alerts um, if you're about to exceed what you've set as your energy budget for the month. Um, and then combining uh, the ability uh, to have visibility into your own costs, you can choose to participate in utility real-time pricing programs. So this will allow you to um, use power when electricity is least expensive and avoid using power when it's the most expensive. Um, so if you look at uh, some of the additional smart apps are um, smart thermostats um, that you are allow, allow you to uh, set your, uh, your limits. Um, and for instance, just by setting your uh, thermostat, uh, you know, two degrees warmer during a hot summer month, uh, you can save $18. So there uh, are some challenges uh, with a smart grid, and there's a perception that smart grid will mean higher utility bills for customers. Um, and according to the uh, U.S. Department of Energy, the smart grid could save $46 billion to $117 billion over the next 20 years by avoiding building additional power plants. And then and the energy efficiency benefits achieved with a smart grid will enable consumers to reduce their consumption on average of 12, uh, 4 to 12 percent, with a net savings of 2 to $35 billion over the next 20 years. Um, one of the other issues um, is that there has been a lack of public awareness. Um, so, especially in the last year, I think that lots of utilities are understanding that they need to get out and um, talk to people about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, and that the smart grid um, is really an important step to um, helping us all take control of our energy. Um, and let's see, um, there's also um, some uh, opponents have mentioned that the demand response programs might benefit higher income consumers than they do low income, income consumers. And there have actually been a number of studies, one in uh, the D.C. area, 
um, that show that uh, the demand response programs do benefit uh, low-income income consumers. And I think the biggest uh, benefit is that it gives all consumers, regardless of income, visibility into how they're using energy and gives people choice and control um, and can help uh, all consumers, regardless of income level, save money. Um, and then there's uh, been mention of the R uh, radio frequency and the health impacts. And there have been numerous studies um, from <clears throat> um, lots of different scientific and independent third parties um, that continue to uh, prove that the emissions um, from the smart meters um, are way under uh, FCC-approved um, limits, and that, in fact, the mo most smart meters use the 900 megahertz um, radios in, their smart, in the smart grid, and those are the same um, as the uh, radio emissions coming from baby monitors, Portable, self, uh, portable phones, remote controlled toys, and medical uh, monitors. So um, if you really look at uh, the energy challenges uh, that we as a country and a world have, um, the smart grid is really an, a, a global priority. Uh, it will provide all of us the ability to um, manage and control our um, energy usage, um, it will help us improve energy efficiency, and it can help us cut down on our overall energy consumption. Um, so there, today there are um, 39 states um, that have uh, that are developing or manufacturing smart grid technologies. Um, so the smart grid is also um, providing an economic boost um, as well as jobs. Uh, U.S. utilities have more than 200 smart grid projects underway, and um, this is really a uh, vital uh, to the success um, of the smart grid, is really an understanding of uh, what, what the smart grid is and how it can help us. So, Cassandra, back to you. Thank you very much. I guess Ruben? Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Ruben, you're next up. And then just a reminder for folks that have joined the call, we will be doing questions and answers at the end of our time together, so the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes of the session. And a reminder again, if you want to ask a question either to uh, a person directly, you can use the chat box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen on the, um, in the WebEx, or you can also send it to everybody. So that's how we'll do our questions and answers at the end. So, Ruben, can you take it away? Absolutely. Um, and will the slideshow uh, flip to my PowerPoint now? You can advance it. Just click the next button. Ah, wonderful. Our happy earth. <laughs> um, I'm Ruben Aronin, the Director of Communications for Global Green, and I uh, have been working in the environmental movement here in Southern California and the Hollywood community and nationally um, for the last decade and a half. And uh, Lisa, thank you for your presentation, and Cassandra, thanks for organizing this and, uh, and including my participation. Global Green USA is a national environmental group that is the American affiliate of President Gorbachev's Green Cross International. Uh, we were founded nearly 20 years ago after the first Earth Summit in Rio um, as uh, an organization to help foster a movement that would reconnect humanity with the environment and that recognized that low-income communities and the poor were disproportionately being impacted by environmental degradation. And here in the United States, we focused our effort on creating healthier green buildings um, for schools, for communities, uh, as well as working with groups like Habitat for Humanity to make uh, and build more energy-efficient buildings. Uh, but energy efficiency is very much the holy grail of our work. In many ways, it's the least capital intensive uh, and really no capital needs for uh, conservation. When California was facing our energy crisis a decade ago, it was the conservation efforts of Californians that um, really got us through uh, the crisis where we weren't getting enough out-of-state uh, energy generation. Um, to take a, a step back on the challenges that we face, as I mentioned, Global Green works on uh, 
helping to solve the climate crisis through the built environment, um, and uh, and our world is is sick and it's hot uh, and getting hotter. And scientists uh, are telling us that uh, the change is happening more rapidly. One of our board members, Sebastian Copeland, just uh, is returning from a trek to Antarctica, uh, on, an on foot, unsupported trip, documenting the impacts uh, of our polar ice cap melt. Um, where we're seeing the most alarming trends of global warming and the um, impact of generating electricity is a big piece of the problem. In fact, our built environment um, comprises up to 40% of carbon emissions. So uh, any tools, uh, tricks, and technologies that can help us get at this problem um, are really critical. And uh, it wasn't all that long ago when we witnessed um, New Orleans underwater. And I share this um, uh, visual and the New Orleans tragedy with you because I think it was in 2005 when a lot of the American public woke up to the fact that the impacts of climate change, um, the uh, exacerbated weather uh, events um, like hurricanes and tornadoes and heat waves and droughts, um, are becoming a, a very real danger, a real and present danger. Um, it also, if there was any silver lining to the um, crisis, um, there was an opportunity to introduce in a city that hadn't really known much about energy efficiency or green building, uh, an opportunity to think differently about how they might rebuild that city. And so while Global Green works in cities and communities across the country today, I want to share with you a little bit of the work that we've done in New Orleans, um, a city that 100 years ago was built very energy efficiently, pre-air conditioning. They had to build homes that uh, took advantage of natural building properties to be energy efficient, uh, to be cool and uh, in the uh, summer months and to be warmer in the winter without a lot of energy consumption. Um, we've taken the principles of our work with um, uh, affordable housing developers throughout the country and are building a community. This is the Holy Cross Project in the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, it's uh, one of the homes, and I'll share more of the uh, buildings and designs that have been built since Katrina in the Ninth Ward, but thanks to a design competition that Brad Pitt chaired for us shortly after Katrina, uh, architects from around the world helped to come up with an affordable model green home um, that we could uh, create and offer to um, people who were wanting to rebuild. Our goal was to help 10,000 families rebuild uh, energy-efficient homes. Um, what this uh, screen um, predates a lot of the deployed smart meter technologies that are now at uh, millions of homes. Um, at the time, we actually had to custom build a monitor that would track the real-time energy consumption, but also the real-time energy generation, because these lead platinum homes uh, have their are powered largely by solar. Our goal was to get close to a net zero energy home. Um, this uh, project has been really interesting. Tens of thousands of um, New Orleanians and visitors from around the world uh, who have come through on what was what's known as the disaster tours of the Ninth Ward, sadly, um, have been looking at the green features of the home. And the feature that has caught the most attention has been this real-time energy display, um, this information component. And so what we found is that while there's great interest in the cisterns and the green roof and the solar panels and, not, and green building materials that we introduced to, the, to New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, um, the information sharing of uh, this smart energy meter in the home has been one of the pieces that's been um, uh, really resonating in, when we talk about uh, how we're building a green, how we want to help uh, the community rebuild green. Obviously, this is the uh, one of the smart meters that are now um, percolating everywhere. Global green... Um, I want to share with you the story of um, of impact and why energy efficiency, as I say, is the holy grail um, for for families. We know that with real time energy information, residents, uh, individuals, ha homeowners of all stripes um, save 10 to 15 percent uh, on their electric bill. 
um, we help, helped thousands of uh, low-income families through a novel program called Build It Back Green in New Orleans um, with funding from the Bush Clinton Katrina Fund. Uh, and I want to share with you one story of Miss Shirley Charlotte, um, an 83-year-old native of New Orleans who had to evacuate to the Superdome um, during Katrina. Um, but when she returned to her Holy Cross neighborhood, she's a neighbor of the new project that we're building, um, she uh, attempted to rebuild her home, and like sadly a lot of uh, New Orleans families, there were uh, unscrupulous contractors who really um, defrauded her, uh, left her um, with an unhealthy indoor air quality um, and an, a ridiculously inefficient home um, with energy bills that often topped $400. Ms. Charlo uh, was uh, on oxygen in part uh, because of the unhealthy conditions of her home um, and was literally having to make decisions between, um, you know, paying for food, medicine, um, uh, or her electric bill. Thanks to Global Green and our partnership with the, sustainable, the Center for Sustainable Engagement and Development, um, we were able to bring volunteers to do an audit and a retrofit of her home and today, I'm happy to say that she's off oxygen and her electric bills have been dramatically normalized. Now, I'm sad to say, as you know, an environmental charity um, working in the current economic climate, we don't have the philanthropic funds to continue to the, this program to the level that we want. But we are excited to have just launched a NOLAWISE program in New Orleans with the help of actor Wendell Pierce and uh, Mayor Landrieu, um, the uh, Department of Energy is funding through stimulus dollars a loan program to help families do energy re retrofits affordably in their homes um, to reduce the costs. Given mortgage, the mortgage crisis and bank financing being what it is, not everyone qualifies for that. And so, again, I, I uh, am excited that we are in an era where the technology is being deployed to help uh, families of all kinds um, lower their energy bills um, and be able to put more dollars where they need to be uh, putting it. Um, so our work in New Orleans has miles to go. This is an image of the full building uh, that we're doing in the Ninth Ward uh, as a model sustainability project. It will include five single-family homes that are built, a community action center, um, that we will deploy smart meter technology and provide learning for the community about how to incorporate green building, green living into their own lives, and it'll include a multifamily um, housing complex. Here's a, a better illustration of what that will look like as well. Um, we've built in principles of passive survivability into the community center, which is the, in the front of this slide. Um, so that if there is a catastrophic weather event, this is an area that didn't flood uh, during Katrina. It's on high ground in the Ninth Ward by the levee, but um, uh, there will be potable water and uh, power through solar for uh, residents um, to, to rely upon. The Gulf, sadly, has you know, taught us a lesson in uh, 2010 on our reliance on fossil fuels, the worst oil spill in our nation's history. Uh, happened uh, just off the Gulf, and so we used that tragedy to um, call for a new direction um, for our country and for the Gulf in particular, and are actively working with the mayor and uh, mayors from throughout the Southeast to help um, push a clean energy future for the region um, that also largely, you know, is, um, will use energy efficiency uh, gains as part of the objectives. Um, these trends that we're seeing in uh, the impact of global warming on our coasts, on our communities, they're lasting changes, and I think people feel really powerless to do anything about it. And so the opportunity to utilize real-time information about our energy consumption gives some power back to individuals, um, which we think is really an important component of it. Uh, this illustration just shows the schools, homes, communities that Global Green is touching throughout New Orleans um, through community seminars, through workshops, through home visits um, to help families uh, make their homes healthier, which is a big part of the work that we do um, in, uh, in consulting with homeowners and families, but also uh, making them more 
uh, energy efficient. And once you make an energy savings gain, once you change behavior from uh, individuals, and once you make energy efficient upgrades, for example, in a home, those are permanent, everlasting, annualized savings that really benefit um, people and communities. The inspiration for a lot of this work um, came from a woman in the foreground of this shot, Pam DeShiel. Um, she was the president of the Holy Cross Neighborhood Association, and after Hurricane Katrina, she said, um, I want to rebuild our neighborhood stronger than before. And uh, we collaborated and still collaborate with her and um, the, uh, the leadership of the Holy Cross neighborhood. It, it does take a village to um, help mobilize change and help educate communities on better ways uh, to, um, to be. We don't only work on a community level um, based in Hollywood. We have the uh, opportunity to engage celebrity supporters and stakeholders. And so uh, once a year, for example, in, in uh, less than two weeks, we'll be celebrating our annual pre-Oscar party where we popularize smart solutions to climate change. We have a bevy of celebrities walk a green carpet, arrive in green cars. And 10 years ago, uh, you may remember the first hybrid cars that were gas sippers instead of gas guzzlers, like a lot of the limousines taking celebrities to the Oscars, were not very popular cars. And so uh, we helped to really uh, popularize green vehicles, hybrid vehicles in particular a decade ago, and now they're mainstream and they come in a variety of shapes and colors, and we're seeing the electric vehicle begin to take the road this year. The Chevy Volt will be our featured car uh, participant at this event. And we're excited this year to be focusing not only on transportation solutions, but solutions in the home that people, uh, emerging technologies like the smart meter and smart grid that can really begin to help transform uh, our energy use. Uh, I alluded at the beginning of my presentation to the fact that Global Green works on uh, schools as well. For more than a decade, we've helped to green over $15 billion worth of new construction, but it leaves a lot of existing school buildings uh, where 20% of Americans go every day uh, to a school setting of some kind, um, often to energy inefficient uh, buildings. The um, operations report card that you're seeing is a new mobile app that we're developing. There's a beta in, I in the iTunes store now, and in April we'll be unveiling uh, a, newer ver excuse me, a newer version of it. One component is we in ask students and parents and teachers to get the electric bills of their school. It turns out to be a really challenging process. Um, they're often kept at a district office and getting, you know, a 12-month history of electric bills is challenging. We want to see this real-time technology adopted at the school facility and in classrooms so that when we see behavioral changes, which we encourage in all of our schools, um, students can see that. And we spend more on electricity than we do on books and computers in uh, schools combined. So there's low-hanging fruit to help cash-strap schools um, now in, in, with the current economic climate. Um, this is a picture of our winning school in Austin. We held a national green school makeover competition. It includes significant energy efficiency upgrades that the Texas School for the Deaf in Austin will be deploying. We'll be documenting this project, sharing it on uh, globalgreen.org, and inviting other schools to replicate the energy and water savings that we'll be providing. Um, but the, uh, the tools of, of tomorrow, if you will, uh, are here today, and we found that uh, the uh, communities, particularly um, low-income communities, poor communities, um, and uh, urban communities desperately need to utilize the, these technologies, and a, a big part of that is educating the public, and so I'm excited to um, have the opportunity to share our work a little bit with you but the biggest barrier, I think, is not so much technological anymore. It's sharing uh, the information uh, and getting people to understand that these are tools that can really benefit our communities and allow us to put more dollars uh, where we need to be instead of on wasteful uh, electricity. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ruben. Um, I appreciate the story from New Orleans in particular. 
Uh, next up, we have Reverend Michael Livingston, and I wanted to say before he goes on that one of the things that I forgot to do is just to give a, just a brief little overview of who's sponsoring this webinar. It's the National Council of Churches Eco Justice Program, and then the National Council of Churches is a uh, broad-based Protestant and Orthodox uh, organization that represents 37 member communions. I always say that we don't agree on everything. Uh, including how to take communion, but we do agree on three things, the need to work for peace, the need to try to er eradicate poverty, and then also the need to protect God's creation. So what Reverend Livingston is going to talk about next is the nexus between poverty and eco-justice in regards to smart grids. He is uh, the director of the poverty program for the National Council of Churches and also the past president. So over to you, Reverend Livingston. Thank you, Cassandra. And I think I first want to say I, I want to invite Lisa and Ruben to come to Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, we need your expertise there. And uh, Ruben, I'd like to turn my house over to you. I'm sure you could make it much more energy efficient. I've even got a house in Los Angeles where my parents live on top of the hill that gets sunlight all day long. I'll raise it, and you can build a whole new structure from the ground up. Uh, it's fascinating what we've been listening to, and I appreciate the expertise that has been available to us so far in this call. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. From the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, we learn about the beauty of the earth, of creation. We learn that God views all creation as good, including man and woman. And throughout the Bible, we find that references to the beauty and power of God's creation, including this one from the Psalms that you see on the screen now, uh, that reveal the wonder and the glory of God's work. We're also taught in the stories of the Old and the New Testament to seek justice for the most vulnerable among us. Jesus himself helped the needy, the vulnerable. He helped all those who needed help, regardless of their station in life, whether rich or poor, man or woman, elderly or children, regardless of the color of their skin, where they lived or who they knew. And as we've heard from Lisa and Reuben, there are tremendous opportunities that are available to us with smart grid technology, opportunities that provide us practical ways to live out our Christian call to serve as stewards of God's creation, and to seek justice for all of God's people. We've heard that smart grids use dynamic pricing to charge for the amount used when energy is in higher demand, and to charge less for energy that's used during peak times uh, off-peak times, rather, when utilities don't require as much production. However, dynamic pricing has costs and benefits, particularly for low-income families and those whose schedules may not be as flexible as others. We know that low-income consumers have a flatter usage curve than other consumers so that they use less during peak hours. So when utilities use pricing that puts a premium price on energy use during peak hours, low-income consumers benefit. But they could also be harmed if their schedule demands that they have to use energy during peak hours. And there are other consumer populations that we ought to consider. Those who work from home, the invalid, the elderly who spend most of their time at home, at-home daycare programs that need energy at all times of the day. There have been a number of pilots and other kinds of studies that have been conducted to see if low-income consumers are as responsive to dynamic pricing as higher-income consumers. And the jury is still out. It's really inconclusive. Sometimes they're half as responsive, as uh, eager to have this. Uh, sometimes they were the same, responsive in about the same percentage as higher income consumers. 
and sometimes they're twice as responsive to the possibilities that are offered by smart grid technology. And then there's one last thing to consider, and that is the impact of the smart grid on renters. Often electric, uh, electricity is included in the rent, so the challenge would be to find a way to educate renters and landlords about their utilities and to make sure that renters are paying an appropriate amount of energy uh, for the energy that they use, an appropriate amount for the energy that they, uh, that they use. So there are great opportunities that are available through smart grid technology. We just need to be sure that we pay special attention to these low-income users and special populations as this is implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Livingston, and thank you, Ruben, and thank you also, Lisa. Now, if we're going to spend the rest of our time. We have about 19 minutes. Um, so if anybody has any questions that they would like to um, put forth, you can put them in the chat box. You can send them directly to me, and you can send them to the group, and we can ask the presenters. And then there is a question of folks wanted to want to know if the PowerPoint can be available. We're actually going to put the audio and the visuals up on the web, and we can send that to everybody that registered for this, so that you can have that available. And then we'll also send the we'll have the link available to this presentation on our website, which is www.nccecojustice.org. So does anybody have any questions? Cassandra, uh, while we were waiting for questions, I'd love to share uh, one thing that we did um, to address the electricity bill embedded in rent. We Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to address Michael's uh, comment. We did a net zero energy project near San Diego, and they had that very problem to address, and we were, um, we were able to create a mechanism where instead of having um, the landlord pay for wildly fluctuating electric bills, um, we had a solar project where 80% of the electricity was generated on site, so we were able to embed a $50 a month uh, electric charge into the rent. It lowered everybody's electric costs, um, and the landlord also saved money uh, once they redeemed the incentives from the solar installation, um, federal and state solar incentives. So everybody was able to actually save dollars in the operating of this uh, affordable housing um, new construction in Poway, California. Great. Thank you. And I also want to make sure that folks, if they want some more information on the research, the Edison Foundation did some research on low-income consumers and how smart grid technology can impact them. And that was a June 2010 uh, summary report, white paper that they did. If anybody needs the link to that, I'm happy to um, post that on our website. And then also to let you know that uh, going back to whether you can save this presentation, you can just click File up on your screen and you can save it directly from there. And we have a few questions that came in. Um, one question from Brian Webb is he wants to know um, how he can find out where smart technology, smart grid technology currently exists. And I don't know, Lisa, if you want to try to answer that question of where it already exists. Lisa, are you on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I can send a map of where uh, smart grid technologies are deployed. Um, I can also tell you, uh, depending on where you live, um, a lot of major utilities um, are in the process of deploying the, the projects. Um, everyone from uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, uh, on the East Coast, Florida Power and Light, uh, San Diego, um, it's actually on the West Coast. Um, so there are a number of um, utilities throughout the country that are in the process of deploying this. Um, and then one other um, point on the low-income housing um, issue. Uh, as I mentioned, um, there was a program that ran last summer in um, Washington, D.C., in conjunction with PEPCO, and it was called the D.C. Power Sense Program, and we can also uh, provide a link to that program and the results. 
Great. Thanks, Lisa. And I think also in that Edison white paper, they mentioned that Baltimore study. So it's an aggregate. I think they did five different studies, and they put that together in a white okay. paper. So I'll make sure that that's available as well as the direct study link that Lisa, you will provide. Sure. And then there was a question here from Ellen um, Bruckner. Uh, I think that's how, Ellen, you pronounce your last name. I apologize if I didn't pronounce it correctly. Um, are there recommended websites that will give statistics for us to use in the education of our local areas and institutions? We actually have a smart grid resource that we put together online from the Ecojustice program, so that's available that you can take a look at. And then what we can do is maybe have some other uh, websites available. I don't know, Lisa, if you or Ruben have some suggestions for recommended websites. Uh, sure. There is um, one called the Smart Grid uh, Consumer Collaborative, um, and they have a lot of information on, on what the Smart Grid is um, and terrific resources. So uh, I will also provide that as a follow-up. Ruben, do you have anything? At, uh, global, at globalgreen.org, there's a great fact sheet on a Smart Grid that we have. We also uh, released a white paper uh, that has some good facts. Uh, and data, not just on smart grid deployment and uh, the value of economic savings from efficiency gains, but also some learnings from utilities who deployed uh, smart meter, smart grid technologies effectively and engaged their consumers and other utilities who didn't do as terrific a job and had some challenges with deployment. Great. And I'll make, again make sure that we put that on our website. And then we have a question, what are the challenges of this for rural areas, such as in Wyoming? I don't know who wants to field that question. Ruben, I don't know if you can field that if you're in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I am working in uh, places like Youngstown, Ohio, where we're helping a uh, Rust Belt city um, reconfigure their land use um, and actually promoting sustainable agricultural practices in what used to be an urban area. Um, as far as how quickly smart grid and smart meters de being deployed in Wyoming, I don't know that specifically. I know that the energy efficiency gains that we can, that you know, are uh, universal, whether you're in an, a dense urban environment you know, or a rural environment. That's correct. And then from a technology side, there there are uh, technology solutions that are available for rurals as well, rural areas. Great. And then the next question um, is, uh, let's see, from Ellen again. Oh, let's see. Wait a second. Karen Neely. Um, she says, how do we get information about um, these types of programs, you know, renewable energy and then um, doing the low-income smart grids? How do we get that type of information out there? I don't know if anybody wants to take a crack at that. Well, I, I think that um, this is an example of trying to educate uh, leaders in, in communities across the country. Um, and this is one of the challenges um, of the smart grid. Uh, so I think there are the smart grid consumer collaborative um, organizations like Global Green, uh, technology companies like Silver Spring Networks. Um, we're all working together to help educate. So again, we can provide uh, links that will provide additional information. And then as Cassandra mentioned, um, the NCC has also put together a lot of resources available uh, to you. I think and, I uh, can I, go ahead, Michael. Yeah. I think I want to say we don't really want to just depend on companies um, that are involved in this, helping us to transfer to more sustainable ways, more cost-effective ways of providing energy. But I think it's a moral imperative on especially the Christian community and the church to take leadership in helping to inform our members, our parishioners about this. So it ought to be in Sunday school programs for children as they grow and develop, and adult education, and our pastors ought to be even making reference at least, if not preaching, this kind of uh, message, the stewardship of God's creation um, with some regularity. It, it, this isn't just for the energy conscious uh, technological side, but it's also because of the moral imperative involved for the, 
the church as well. Thank you. That's a good point. Um, Karen also has sort of a follow-up observation. She says, and the reason why she it seems like she asked that question about um, how to get more information out there is she says it took her a couple of years before she even learned about it from a local sustainable magazine. And then her follow-up question is, is there legislation in the works, and this uh, speaks, uh, Reverend Livingston, to what you talked about, is there legislation in the works that might encourage landlords to offer this and smart grid participation options through the energy providers? And I don't know, Lisa, if you have uh, an answer to that question. Uh, that I, I'm, I don't know. So I, we can research that and get back to her. What I can share with you from California's perspective is um, we uh, authored a law that Governor Schwarzenegger signed, the Better Buildings Law, which is uh, requiring the existing California buildings built before 1978 more than 75% of our uh, buildings uh, are not built to the uh, highest energy code, Title 24. And um, we're now figuring out with a, a, um, a government organization called the California Energy Commission how we're going to meet that law. Uh, and uh, smart meter technology is going to help with real-time information for building managers, building owners, to be able to reduce their energy consumption. Um, we're finding that, sadly, even with LEED-certified buildings uh, that are built with green materials, they're not always operated uh, the most efficiently way that they could. And this delay in pricing is a real challenge in helping to reward, incentivize uh, energy efficiency. So that's one um, legislative uh, you know, piece that I can share with you. Uh, the other the other issue is from a utilities perspective, um, you know, they've been uh, in some places more aggressive and in some places less in uh, educating their consumers about deploying the technology and then actually doing it so that it's most useful to the end user, the consumer, to save money on their electric bill. Uh, another follow-up question. Thanks, Ruben. Um, this is from Ellen. Um, Bruckner, are there resources that show how churches have begun to use some of this technology? And I don't know of anybody, any, Ruben, do you, have you heard of any? I have not. I don't know if Lisa has. I totally agree that that would be useful to get. Yeah. Um, yes, actually there is, there is another organization called the Interface Power and Light, I believe, mm -hmm. um, organization um, that has been very active in helping churches um, become much more energy efficient. Right, but the question was about using the technology of smart grid. Um, that, that I'll have to I'll ha have to research, Cassandra. Okay, and then another question is: Are there any political advocacy plans that are underway to advocate for the expansion of smart grid? I think there's a lot of. Uh, it's not a core uh, lobbying activity of Global Greens. Um, but there's uh, both from the industry side and from the environmental perspective a recognition that we have to, as Lisa showed, uh, improve our grid technology from, you know, over 100 years ago that we're operating on a really old dinosaur electric grid. And this rolls into a lot of public policy conversations about investment in infrastructure generally. Um, and then the question is who's going to pay for those upgrades and improvements. Um, it's a critical need that we have if we're going to be competitive um, so that we're not just generating cleaner power, but that we're efficiently distributing it to where it needs to go and, uh, and maximizing the efficiency. Um, so it, it really is quite a challenge, but yeah, Lisa, you may want to elaborate on you know, um, the, the lobbying side of that. Um, I believe, believe there are industry um, and energy efforts to really increase the, uh, the knowledge of this and, as well as underscore the need. Um, and this was actually a cleaner, delivering cleaner energy more efficiently um, was a key component of the um, energy bill. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Lance asked the question, he says, it's great that Global Green was able to work with architects to design high efficient green homes in New Orleans, but how can those plans be shared with those of us in other parts of the country? And if Global Green owns these plans, might that be a part of raising funds by selling those plans to others at an affordable cost? Ruben, I think that question is for you. 
a great question. I'm working with the architects to try to see if we can actually do that for no cost. But maybe my uh, board would appreciate your suggestion of finding a, a revenue uh, opportunity out of it since we're always needing to raise more dollars for our program. We're working to try to do that. Um, the challenge with the competition is we've got a good shotgun home that fits the climactic uh, conditions and aesthetics of New Orleans. It may not be universally transferable, so we're starting with uh, trying to have a universal uh, uh, blueprint uh, architectural plan, at least for the New Orleans community, and we're working on that right now. Um, but I like your idea of, of sharing something like that that could be uh, more widely accessible. And this is another comment from Lance, um, which I think is uh, very interesting, and I'd love uh, Reverend Livingston for you to make a comment on this. Don't you think we need to partner with outreach, outreach ministries that are focused on helping the poor to employ this technology for the benefit of the poor? So many times the church sets up silos and communication doesn't get shared or partnered across ministries. Getting social justice behind this issue is, will bring more to the table. Oh, that's a great comment. And, of course, that's a part of the reason that I'm involved in this call. Uh, I share office space with the Eco-Justice Program of the National Council of Churches. And we have ongoing dialogue across our programmatic areas. Uh, mine is domestic poverty and, of course, the Eco-Justice Program. But there are great implications in this work for low-income uh, communities and for people who are at the bottom of the economic uh, ladder. That community of people contributes less to uh, the um, uh, challenges to the ecosystem, uh, and yet it, it, uh, it is harmed the most at the same time. So it's incumbent upon us to keep these two elements in, in uh, conversation with one another. Part of the eco-justice program is a, uh, a contract with uh, a preacher uh, who is working primarily in the southeast, but to help raise awareness among African-American churches about um, ecological issues. So that's a very great comment, and we are paying attention to it, even though, of course, a great more could and should be done. And then the, to close us out, because we're coming to the end of our time, um, I just want to share this comment from Robert Murray. And he says, uh, I'm with the Interfaith Environmental Network slash Energy Action Team in Austin, Austin, Texas, and we're facing a massive utility rate increase. What we need right now are practical, uh, practical success stories of innovative financing for cost-effective energy efficiency investments that are not getting made, thus requiring Austin Energy to make supply-side investments that are many times more expensive, this penalizing the entire community. Uh, and I think that's a great comment, and it goes hand-in-hand. Hand. The smart grid technology helps measure, but the next piece is what do you put in place to reduce your energy costs? So that's a great um, thing to end on. Um, and then any of other questions that folks have that we weren't able to answer, you're free, feel free to email myself. It's Cassandra at nccecojustice.org. You can also email info at nccecojustice.org. And again, our website is www.nccecojustice.org. And I want to thank all the presenters for taking some time today out of their busy schedules to give us a little bit of a look into smart grid technology and then how that actually impacts us as people of faith. So thank you very much for everyone uh, to, for joining us today on this call. Thank you. Thank you so much.